29. The birth of our Lord Jesus. June 6, 1944. I still see the inside of the poor stony shelter where Mary and Joseph have found refuge, sharing the lot of some animals. The little fire is dozing together with its guardian. Mary lifts her head slowly from her bed and looks around. She sees that Joseph's head is bowed over his chest, as if he were meditating, and she thinks that his good intention to remain awake has been overcome by tiredness. She smiles lovingly, and making less noise than a butterfly lighting on rose, she sits up, and then goes on her knees. She prays with a blissful smile on her face. She prays with her arms stretched out, almost in the shape of a cross, with the palms of her hands facing up and forward, and she never seems to tire in that position. She then prostrates herself with her face on the hay, and an even more ardent prayer, a long prayer. Joseph rouses. He notices that the fire is almost out and the stable almost dark. He throws a handful of very slender heath on the fire and the flames are revived. He then adds some thicker twigs and finally some sticks, because the cold is really biting. The cold of a serene winter night that comes into the ruins from everywhere. Poor Joseph must be frozen sting as he is near the door, if we can call a door the hall, where Joseph's mantle serves as a curtain. He warms his hands near the fire, then takes his sandals off and warms his feet. When the fire is gaily blazing, and its light is steady, he turns around. But he does not see anything, not even Mary's white veil that formed a clear line on the dark hay. He gets up and slowly moves towards her pallet. Are you not sleeping, Mary? He asks. He asks her three times until she turns around and replies. I am praying. Is there anything you need? No, Joseph. Try and sleep a little. At least try and rest. I will try. But I don't get tired praying. God be with you, Mary. And with you, Joseph. Mary resumes her position. Joseph, to avoid falling asleep, goes on his knees near the fire and prays. He prays with his hands pressed against his face. He removes them now and again to feed the fire, and then resumes his ardent prayer. Apart from the noise of the crackling sticks, and the noise made now and again by the donkey stamping its hooves on the ground, no other sound is heard. A thin ray of moonlight creeps in through a crack in the vault, and seems a blade of unearthly silver looking for Mary. It stretches as length as the moon climbs higher in the sky, and at last reaches her. It is now on her head, where it forms a halo of pure light. Mary lifts her head, as if she had a celestial call, and she gets up, and goes on to her knees again. Oh, how beautiful it is here now. She raises her head, and her face shines in the white moonlight, and becomes transfigured by a supernatural smile. What does she see? What does she hear? What does she feel? She is the only one who can tell what she saw, heard and felt in the radiant hour of her maternity. I can only see that the light around her is increasing more and more. It seems to come down from heaven, to arise from the poor things around her, above all it seems to originate from herself. Her deep blue dress now seems of a pale myositus blue, and her hands and face are becoming clear blue, as if they were placed under the glare of a huge sapphire. This hue is spreading more and more on the things around her, it covers them, purifies them, brightens everything. It reminds me, although it is somewhat softer, of the hue I see in the vision of holy paradise, and also of the color I saw in the visit of the wise men. The light is given off more and more intensely from Mary's body, it absorbs the moonlight. She seems to be drawing to herself all the light that can descend from heaven. She is now the depository of the light. She is to give this light to the world. And this blissful, uncontainable, immeasurable, eternal, divine light which is about to be given, as heralded by a dawn, a morning star, a chorus of atoms of light that increase continuously like her tide, and rise more and more like incense, and descend like a large stream and stretch out like veils. The vault, full of crevices, of cobwebs, of protruding rubble balanced by a miracle of physics, the dark, smoky repellent vault, 
now seems the ceiling of a royal hall. Each boulder is a block of silver, each track an opal flash, each cobweb a most precious canopy interwoven with silver and diamonds. A huge green lizard, hibernating between two stones, seems an emerald jewel forgotten there by queen, and a bunch of hibernating bats is like a precious onyx chandelier. The hay from the upper manger, as no longer grass blades. It is pure silver wires quivering in the air with the grace of loose hair. The dark wood of the lower manger, as a block of burnished silver. The walls are covered with a brocade in which the white silk disappears under the pearly embroidery of the relief. And the soil. What is the soil now? It is crystal lit up by white light. Its protrusions are like roses thrown in homage of the soil. The holes are precious cups from which perfumes and scents are to arise. And the light increases more and more. It is now unbearable to the eye. And the virgin disappears in so much light, as if she had been absorbed by an incandescent curtain. And the mother emerges. Yes. When the light becomes endurable once again to my eyes, see Mary with the newborn son in her arms. A little baby, rosy and plump bustling with his little hands as big as rosebuds, and kicking with his tiny feet, that could be contained in the hollow of the heart of a rose, and is crying with a thin trembling voice, just like a newborn little lamb, opening his pretty little mouth, that resembles a wild strawberry, and showing a tiny tongue, that trembles against the rosy roof of his mouth, and he moves his little head, that are so blonde, that it seems without any hair, a little round head, that his mummy holds in the hollow of her hand, while she looks at her baby, and adores him weeping and smiling, and at the same time, and she bends down to kiss him, not on his innocent head, but on the center of his chest, where underneath there is his little heart beating for us, where one day there will be the wound, and the mother is doctoring that wound in advance, with her immaculate kiss, the ox, Woken up by the dazzling light, gets up with a great noise of hooves and bellows, a donkey turns its head around and brays. It is the light that rouses them, but I love to think, that they wanted to greet their creator, both for themselves, and on behalf of all the animals. Also, Joseph, who almost in rapture, was praying so ardently, as to be isolated from what was around him, now rouses and he sees the strange light filter through the fingers of his hands pressed against his face. He removes his hands, lifts his head and turns around. The ox, standing as it is, hides Mary. But she calls him on, Joseph, come. Joseph rushes. And when he sees, he stops, struck by reverence, and he is about to fall on its knees where he is. But Mary insists, come, Joseph, and she leans on the hay with her left hand, and, holding the child close to her heart with her right one, she gets up and moves towards Joseph, who is walking embarrassed, because of the conflict in him between his desire to go, and his fear of being irreverent. They meet at the foot of the straw bed, and they look at each other, weeping blissfully. Come, let us offer Jesus to the Father, says Mary. And while Joseph kneels down, she stands up between two trunks supporting the vault. She lifts up her creature in her arms and says, Here I am. On his behalf, O God, I speak these words to you, here I am to do your will. And I, Mary, and my spouse, Joseph, with him. Here are your servants, O Lord. May your will always be done by us, in every hour, in every event, for your glory and your love. Then Mary bends down and says, Here, Joseph, take him, and offers him the child. What? I? Me? Oh, no. I am not worthy. Joseph is utterly dumbfounded at the idea of having to touch God. But Mary insists, smiling, You are well worthy. No one is more worthy than you are, and that is why the Most High chose you. Take him, Joseph, and hold him, while I look for the linens. Joseph, blushing almost purple, stretches his arms out and takes the baby, who is screaming, because of the cold, and when he has him in his arms, he no longer persists in the, in the intention of holding him far from himself, out of respect, 